are Mormons Christians? Can men become gods? Uh, salvation by faith, or is it by works, or is it by both? These are some of the topics that often come up in Mormon and evangelical conversations about Christianity, and that is exactly what we're going to discuss today. I have uh, two eminently qualified people to discuss this. Can introduce both of them. Let me start with Eric Johnson, a full disclosure, personal friend of mine. Uh, we wrote a book together, edited a book together called Sharing the Good News with Mormons, have been friends for decades, and recently had Eric on the show, and we were talking about some of the biggest challenges to Mormonism, and uh, Eric works with the Mormonism Research Ministry. Uh, Eric, thanks for coming. First, tell us why you agreed to have this conversation, and I'll come to Scott to introduce himself. Thanks for having me on tonight, Sean. I, I want to make it clear that I'm here tonight not to debate the specific doctrines of Mormonism. And the reason I say that is we have so many different things we want to talk about that we're not going to have time in the short hour to be able to do that. So I agreed to do this tonight because Scott told you uh, that he wanted to correct how he believed Mormon doctrines were wrongly described on our show that we did, you and I, Sean, on December 9th, as we talked about the Gospel Topics essays. And that's a series of writings that were published by the LDS Church, published on their website. Those were done between 2013 and 2015. So my goal is that we could spend time today not discussing whether or not the religion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the official name of this church, uh, teaches true doctrines, but rather what I want to do is, is show how this church teaches in a way that what it re realistically and in reality teaches. I'm asking Scott, uh, how did either Sean or I describe LDS teachings wrong on our show that you said we did, and if he can show me from the church written, the church's written standard works, and those are for anybody who is not familiar with Mormonism, there's four works, the Bible, the King James Version officially of the Bible, as far as it's translated correctly according to the Eighth Article of Faith, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and also the Pearl of Great Price, as well as the teachings of his leaders and the correlated curriculum produced by his church. And if he can show me with those that I have misstated what Mormonism teaches, I'm willing to reconsider the ways that I might have misportrayed uh, Scott's religion. But on the other hand, if it's shown tonight that I actually Mormonism, even though I'm not a Mormon, then I would ask Scott, along with other Latter-day Saints, and I've made this challenge to many uh, Latter-day Saints and whoever's watching the show tonight, to be ever so careful in saying that people like myself don't have an accurate grasp on the doctrine of this religion because I've been studying this religion for about 40 years, and I think I do have a pretty good grasp even though I'm not a Latter-day Saint. And also, one last thing I want to say is that December 13th, Scott wrote two different series of Twitter posts where he critiqued some of the things that I said, and I responded to both of those at our website, mrm.org slash Scott. And in, I've also included there in that article notes for tonight uh, using links. And if anybody would like to go see, I wrote about five different articles, including the notes I'll use tonight. Just go to mrm.org slash Scott. They'll find that information, citations from his sources, and I'm only able to present a small amount of that tonight. That's great. I just put it in the notes for people to look up if they want to track with that. Uh, Scott, let me come to you. I recently met you. We didn't know except each other except for a few weeks ago, and you weighed in very graciously and said, hey, I see things a little bit differently. So first, tell us a little bit about who you are and your interest in this conversation. Sure thing. So I grew up a member of the church. Uh, in southeast Idaho. I've uh, lived here most of my life. I served an LDS mission in Jamaica right around 2001 to 2003. I've held different positions in the church. I've been a youth teacher. I've been uh, uh, a high counselor, which is uh, somebody that gives advice to congregations. And I'm a counselor and a bishopric. So we're over one congregation. I'm like uh, the number three guy that helps the bishop out. Okay. Um, and you know watched your presentation that the two of you did and i think uh overall I, I just wanted to address kind of the the tone and the way that presentation was given and how maybe some of the things that you said didn't completely act, represent what we believe as members and we'll have that discussion tonight and people can decide for themselves 
That's great. Well, I appreciate your willingness to come on and discuss these topics that are sensitive and important. So let me start with the question that we agreed to discuss first, are Mormons Christians? And Eric, I know you've had some concern with that, uh, with the idea that Mormons are Christians. State very briefly what your concern is, and then I want to hear back from Scott what his response would be. Well, historically, the word Christian has a particular meaning, including a set of doctrines, such as who is God, who is Jesus, uh, the Trinity is involved in that, salvation by grace alone through faith. Those are some of the uh, essential issues of the historic Christian church. Uh, it really hasn't been uh, until the last 20, 30 years or so that many Latter-day Saints have wanted to be called Christian, oftentimes Latter-day Saints would say they didn't want to in the older days. They wanted to be known as Mormons, a term that isn't official and, in fact, uh, has been discouraged by uh, the current president, uh, Russell M. Nelson. Uh, we're not supposed to use the term Mormon, although it's just a nickname that has been used in the past. But problem, and, and, and let me just get this straight, Latter-day Saints are allowed to believe anything that they want. They, they're free to believe that. But I think there's a problem in communication when uh, a Mormon says that he or she is a Christian uh, because uh, when you look at the doctrines of Mormonism, according to what the leaders teach, according to what the standard works teach, there's a, a big difference between what historic biblical Christianity teaches okay. and what Mormonism teaches. And, and so uh, I would say if I have COVID and I tell you I have COVID, but I don't have the symptoms and I haven't had the test, but I just say, well, I have COVID. I think we need to look at that with a little bit of, well, are you sure you have COVID? Yeah, I, I'm not feeling well. I feel fatigued. You might have COVID, but you got to go do a test if you did. And I know people who've never gotten the test and claim they've had COVID. Well, there's no way to prove that. And so I say, let's take uh, the religion of the Latter-day Saints and see if it stands the test according to what biblical Christianity says. Okay, well, we can unpack some of those particulars, but tell us what your initial reaction is, Scott. I think a lot of it comes down to what do we mean when we say the term Christian? Um, I think Latter-day Saints have always viewed themselves as Christians. In the Book of Mormon, uh, the people in the Book of Mormon identify themselves as Christians. But what we mean by that is not that we are Protestant, of course. We have huge doctrinal differences with Protestants. I don't dispute that at all. Um, and I guess, you know, a lot of people might use those two terms to mean the same thing. When people say they're Christian, they don't mean just that they worship Christ, but they mean what Eric is saying, that they adhere to a certain set of uh, creeds and different things that that make up, uh, you know, the Catholic side of Christianity and uh, all of the things that descended from that. And I guess, you know, it's up for every person to decide is it appropriate to say, you know, I, I hear some... Uh, uh, Protestants would say that, or that Eastern Orthodox aren't Christian, or on and on. Um, people are free to do that, but to me, if you're Christian, that means you look to your Savior and Redeemer, and that's what we say. It. We were Christ. He's our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He's the Son of God. Okay, so essentially, to you. The Christian faith would be one who considers Jesus Savior and Redeemer. It's really ultimately that simple. Um, Eric, I suspect you might push back a little bit on that understanding within the LDS Church. And, and I want to ask Scott questions, if that's okay, too. Sure. Uh, based on Because I don't want to take all the time. He's the, the Latter-day Saint. I'm not. But I guess what I would ask, uh, hey, well, in uh, Mormonism, the name of Jesus is in the church's name, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. We believe in Jesus. I've heard that many different times. But I would ask Scott the question, do you believe in the great apostasy? Uh, yeah, we believe that there was a falling away that was prophesied and took place. All right. And so, and that's what uh, we talked about, Sean, on a show that we did a few weeks ago. And I, I think I even cited Joseph Smith history, chapter one, uh, verses 18 and 19, where Joseph Smith said he went to inquire the Lord in the sacred grove. And he asked, which of all sets right, all the churches at the time. And uh, he was addressed by God the Father and Jesus. And this is what he was told. 
I was answered that I must join none of them, none of the churches that were in existence in the Palmyra area, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds, not some, all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines of the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And I guess what I would say is if Mormonism is true, it is the only church which has the authority of God. It has the priesthood that's uh, it's, it's restored from biblical Christianity soon after the apostles died. All of the churches are wrong. And so, Sean, you and I, no matter how sincere we are, our baptism doesn't matter in the Christian churches that we had done. The communion we take is not authoritative. We don't have priests. Uh, this is a major issue. And so I think it's really important. And this is why I think using the term Christian is a problem because people get confused just because you believe in Jesus. This will do Muslims and Hare Krishnas, but uh, the devotees and Hare Krishna, but uh, we wouldn't say that they are Christian either. So I, I'm not trying to, uh, to say Mormons are bad people by saying that I don't think that their view on who God is, who Jesus is, and how a person gets salvation just because those are wrong doesn't mean that they can't be good people. I just think they might be sincerely mistaken about truth. And that's the reason why I moved to Utah in 2010 to be full time in Christian ministry, because I really do love the LDS people. Scott, let me have you jump in here and maybe talk about the what's often called the apostasy back in the vision that Joseph Smith had in the way Eric described it. What would be your response? Sure. And for those watching, if you see goofy expressions on our faces free, our video is a little delayed, so <laughs> have some grace. Um, <clears throat> well, just as a larger whole, I would say, yeah, we do believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a restored church, restored by Christ with the fullness of the gospel, with the keys of the priesthood needed to govern it, and all of that. But in saying that, I would never look at another Christian and say, well, you're not a Christian because you don't believe in the Latter-day Saint Church. I acknowledge that they look to Christ, they're doing the best that they can with what they have, and to the best of their ability and belief, they're sincerely devoted to the Savior. And yeah, do we disagree on, on how best to do that? Sure. But I think there's enough grace in there that the Lord has a way to sort out who really best and who's not. And you know, that's one of the great uh, things about the doctrine of the LDS Church is that we have, you know, a revelation that shows how even if you're not baptized as a member of this church in, in this life, God still provided a way for you to fulfill your calling on this earth and return and live with him and dwell with him in this son forever. Eric, your thoughts? Is that, does that satisfy you, or I suspect you might still see it a little bit differently? Well, again, I want to make it a point that I'm not saying that Mormons are bad people. And I don't normally say, well, you're a Mormon, you're, you're not a Christian. I mean, uh, I don't use the word cult either. We, we talked about this in the first chapter of a book that we wrote, Bill McKeever and myself, the founder of Mormonism Research Ministry, chapter one of answering Mormon's questions. And we asked the question, are Mormons Christians and do, or, and, and do they belong to a cult? And I don't use the word cult because that has connotations. And the wrong thing, because we think of maybe Hare Krishnas or somebody who stand on a street corner begging. And, and that's not a fair, accurate portrayal of who Latter-day Saints are. But I, I just, uh, as, as much as we may have similarities in wanting good for other people as you served a mission and wanted to help uh, those that you were sharing the, the, your faith with, all the motives that you have, I, you seem like a nice person, very much so. And I've read your, your uh, uh, Twitter feeds, and uh, I disagree with you, but I think we can disagree uh, fairly. And, uh, and so, again, I, I'm not saying, well, Therefore, I think Mormons are bad people. They're not. But at the same time, is Mormonism Christianity? See, I'm not against the other day saying. I am against the ism. I'm against Mormonism because I think, in the view that I have, and I think, Sean, you have this as well, is that a person is either saved or they're not saved. There's no in-between. And a person who's not a saved individual, 
we do believe in hell eternity and that is something that i don't want to have anybody go through and especially with so many uh, latter-day saints leaving especially in the last few years the church has seen a huge decline in convert rate and people leaving the church and many of them 44 percent are headed toward atheism agnosticism or nothing at all i want to prevent that so when people do leave I especially want to make sure that I make Christianity available and help them to understand because you don't believe in Mormonism doesn't mean that you have to become an atheist or you have to throw Jesus out like the baby with the bathwater. I think it's important that people understand that beyond Mormonism, and it's not an atheism, it's having a relationship with the Jesus of the Bible. Hmm. Scott, your thoughts? Sure. So one thing I'd just like to, to, to differentiate, so you, you bring up like Muslims and Hare Krishnas, and I think we would both agree that they're not Christian and don't claim to be Christian because they don't look to Christ as their Lord and Savior and Redeemer. They look, you know, in the case of Muslims, they look to him as a prophet, but not the ultimate prophet and certainly not the world. And in that way, I think we would be right to say that a Muslim is not a Christian and they don't claim to be a Christian and that they do revere Christ but not to the degree that we do, looking to him as our God and as our Lord and Savior and as the man who rose on the third day and redeemed us from death and hell. Um, and uh, again, we're going to have doctrinal differences. I don't dispute that at all. And I'm, you know, one of our articles of faith is that we allow all men to worship the way that they want to. And, you know, again, there's a, there's a certain amount of grace that we should have for each other to say, <clears throat> you know, our is uh, so. For example, in uh, in Christianity, there's a lot of dispute about different doctrines as far as is baptism necessary, what is the Holy Ghost, what is speaking in tongues, what is this, what is that, and I hear a lot of Christians who would say, well, those those uh, disagreements are not key and so if you believe in christ you have hope for redemption right and in latter-day saints there seems to be a special exemption where well if you don't believe in this exact way that we view the trinity you're not a christian and you can't hope for redemption so eric if, if i'm if I'm right here, yeah, I think, right. Eric, you might make a distinction between essential and secondary doctrines, and you would say different denominations differ on secondary doctrines, but something like the Trinity would be essential, and that, I, yeah, is that you're fair? Yeah, exactly right on that. There's, a, there's the essential issues of Christianity, and there is the peripheral issues, and so when we're talking about the nature of God, Christians have always considered the utmost importance, and whole councils have been held. I mean, for instance, in 325 AD, we had a council called the Council of Nicaea. There was a guy named Arius who was going around saying Jesus was just a created a God uh, being, and he was not God in the flesh, as it had been believed for the most part for the first 300 years of church history. And it took a council for the bishops to come together, over 300 of them, for them to, the Bible teaches that he's not just a God. So when it comes to the nature of god when it comes to who jesus is is jesus just a child of god like we are or was has he always been god himself uh incarnate uh do we believe in salvation by grace or are there certain things that we have to do including baptism including uh going to the temple all the things that are required in mormonism we have to understand uh, the terminology that uh, Scott and I can use, or any Latter-day Saint and Evangelical Christian can use, will be the same terms, but we have different meanings to them. And so that's one of the things that I always encourage people to do, is never assume what the Latter-day want to assume, what Scott believes, besides what I've seen in his Twitter feed, uh, but rather to ask them, what is it that you believe about the Trinity? What do you believe about God once being a man and then let them explain but not explain still sounds Christian and when we use the term salvation for instance there's different meanings to that uh, there's a general salvation that everybody gets because of the obedience that every person had as spirit children in the pre-existence we chose Jesus one-third of our brothers and sisters did not as 
Sean and I described that on, on the previous show. And so one third of the spirits, according to LDS teaching, were cast out of heaven and became the demons. And the other two thirds were given the chance to progress in what's called mortality, the second estate. And the hope then in salvation is not general salvation because that's just one of three kingdoms of glory. The hope in Mormonism is to make it to the very best this religion has to offer. And that's called the celestial kingdom, celestial glory. It's called exaltation or eternal life. And I hope that a person can become not God, but become as God. And the hope that they will be able to have their family with them forever, that's not taught in Christianity. And so that is an issue, Scott, I would say, is so distinct that we can say that we're not on the same page of these major issues. And yes, Christians in denominations can certainly debate when Jesus is going to return and uh, sovereignty versus free will of man. And there are many issues in-house, sprinkling versus immersion. And you might think that we're disagreed. I'm going to say, and Sean and I don't go to the same church, and I'm sure we probably don't even go to the same denomination. And yet, if we sat down, we would be able to say, this is what we believe. And that's what the creeds were all about. That's why we have Apostles' Creeds, Nicene Creeds, that we can say, this is what we believe. Yes, we may have a few different things, but that would not, that would not uh, differentiate as Christians. We both are Christians who are we're not going to, just like there's probably no two Latter-day Saints who are exactly alike. Um, first okay, off, but, oh, go ahead, Scott. Real quick, just real quick. Um, so why is it that baptism, repentance, faith, Holy Ghost are secondary issues that Christians can disagree on, but the Trinity, which is never mentioned in Scripture, and, you know, we, we as Latter-day Saints do believe that God, the Eternal Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are one God. We understand what that means differently, but we believe that they're one. So why is it that the Trinity has to be believed when it's not a doctrine that we find explicitly stated in the Bible, but those other doctrines are secondary or tertiary and they are well, I, I would answer uh, first off what can you define for me what you believe that what christians believe about the trinity i don't want to do that because i don't think i have the kind of grasp on it that uh, a christian would find suitable to explain it um, okay so when you say one god uh what do you mean mm -hmm. one god in purpose or one God in essence, because the Trinity teaches that God is both one God in essence. Deuteronomy 6, 4, which Jesus cites in, um, in Mark chapter 12, when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus cites right out of Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is Echad. It's repeated in every Jewish synagogue every Saturday on the Shabbat. Uh, and it's the most important thing that's the central point in a monotheistic religion, that God is one in purpose. Uh, of course, God is one in purpose. We don't, we don't the, debate uh, that, part. but one in his essence. And that's, uh, would you agree that Mormonism does not teach in the one essence of, of God? Uh, I guess it depends what you mean by essence. We don't believe that they're the same being. We believe in three beings that are united well, neither do we. as one in purpose. Okay. So, sure. And so again, then that's why I don't want to, you, you know, yeah. define it. Or would you, you say that, I'm not very good I mean, the way that, you're right. saying it, because Christians say uh, it's, you know, it's one of the most important doctrines of our entire faith. And uh, it really explains God, who he is in himself. Uh, and, we, and in the Trinity, we learn everything about his being, that he exists in three persons, so the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet he's one God. It's not contradictory. It's not a, um, it's not a contradictory statement, but uh, as Christians, we believe the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is, a, is God. Not a God, as more teach tritheism, that they're all, yes, they're all gods, but they're not they're not of the one God. And yes, the word Trinity is not found in the Greek Bible in the New Testament because it's a Latin term. It's how uh, Tertullian uh, and early church leaders tried to understand. We have verses that say that Jesus is a man, and yet we have verses that say Jesus is God. I mean, the very beginning of John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the God, the Word was God. And it reads that way in the King James Version, too. Very clearly, a, a, a portrayal of Jesus is not just being a God, but actually being God who uh, who became incarnate according to verse 14 
God be, uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. And so that's a much different picture than what Mormonism teaches about Jesus, that Jesus was a created being, that he was not necessarily with the Father in a previous existence. And so that's why I would say there's a, there's a difference in the nature of God, and uh, Christians cannot have ecumenical ties with, uh, with Latter-day Saints any more than they would Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, or anyone else, even though they claim that they believe in Jesus. I guess I would just say that we believe a lot of what you're saying, but we also disagree on a lot of it. And we find our views to be scriptural, and you don't, and that's fine. We can disagree. That's not a problem. But ultimately, regardless of those things, we still look to Christ as our Lord, our Savior, and Redeemer. And if you don't want to identify us as Christians, that's up to every person. But that's the reason that we do identify as Christians, because we worship Christ. He is our Lord and our Savior and our God. He's our advocate with the Father. He's the, you know, and we're not going to settle this, but that's why I feel that we can claim the title. Can I ask you a question, Scott? Are you would you be fine saying that Jehovah's Witnesses are Christians, even though their view of Jesus is radically different than both of our views, denying that He is God in any sense, and He's Michael the Archangel? Would you have any hesitancy in saying Jehovah's Witnesses are Christians? So I don't feel like I know the Jehovah's Witness doctrine well enough to make that determination. What I think is the right view wants to identify themselves as a Christian. I'm happy to let them do it. Uh, you know, the friend of, our, of mine, uh, Eric Went, we've talked on Twitter. And, you know, he says a lot of times he likes to bring up the question, well, what if I, as a Christian, said I'm a Latter-day Saint? I'd say, well, if, if by Latter-day Saint you mean you're a member of Christ's church in the last days, I'd say, welcome, use the term. Uh, you know, I, I guess ultimately we have to be specific what we mean when we say Christian. And if a Jehovah's Witness wants to identify as Christian and to them they'd say what that means and they believe that, I have a problem with them using the term. I might have disputes with what they believe in doctrine and everything, but I don't like to go around telling people, yes, you can, no, you can't use this term. It's Ultimately, it's a term that belongs to Christ, right? We choose to be his followers. And all over the world, there are people that do that in different ways. And ultimately, it's up to Christ to determine who is actually following him and who's not. And I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go around and police that term. Okay. Uh, let's maybe move on to our our next topic, which will help bring clarity, I think, on this first one. Uh, and this was a question: Can men um, become gods? Does oh, Eric just completely disappeared. Um, Oh, my goodness. We lost both of them. I'm going to give him a second here to call me back. Here we go. Scott Adams is calling. Let's see if we get a better connection this time. Guess in the green room, add to the right. Scott, are you there, buddy? I'm back. I got you. I don't know what happened. Um, that's good. Now your, your, uh, your video is better. I don't have a clue why it's delayed. I got new Wi-Fi. I got a new system. And obviously, uh, it's still 2020. So... Um, sure. Let me Can see if Eric if Eric comes back or not. Let's just continue the conversation. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came up was, "Can th does the LDS Church teach that men can become gods? And uh, one of the points that I know Eric made was the couplet by Lorenzo Snow, famously, who said, as I'm going to get this wrong, as man is... Let me get this right. As man, uh, man is, God once was. And there it God is. is. Now man may become. There you go. And the yeah. I, the idea being for our viewers mm -hmm. that the God who Mormons say they worship was once a human being worshiping a God, and we too, if we follow certain Mormon teachings, can become a God in the same sense. Is that teaching accurate? Tell us your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I think there's two separate questions in there, right? Number one, can we become like our Heavenly Father? And number two, was he once like us, right? And for the first question, I think there is evidence all over the Bible that says that we have every right to expect that we are going to become like our Heavenly Father if we receive eternal life. Um, 
and I know that that's very controversial among Christians, and that's fine. Uh, you know, just a few passages that I think illustrate it, uh, kind of to, to to say what we mean by that more than anything else. Uh, Revelation twenty one seven: He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. John five nineteen. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of God can do nothing in himself. Oh, this is, I'll come back to this one. This is uh, more pertinent to the second question. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore, this is Acts 2, 32 through 33, where we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Oh, that wasn't very good either. Uh, John 10, 34 through 36. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, say that ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Um, and... Can, yeah, go ahead. Okay, let me, hmm. let, let, let me jump in here. We can, we can debate... Oh, Eric is calling us back. <laughs> this is just live to the world, man. Let's see if we can get him. Uh, let's see if I can add him to the left. Um, I'm back. Eric, that wasn't me, man. We we, we yeah. got you. Okay, so we here's here's where we are. Let me catch you up real fast. Uh, we just right. switched to the topic of can men become gods, and um, and Scott cited John five thirty nine, John ten thirty four through thirty six in favor of the idea that we will and can become like our heavenly father in the sense that we too will become as he is first off did i very quickly represent that fairly scott yeah i'd say so okay eric your pushback on that i know you see it differently go ahead and by the way there were some comments scott that said thank you for coming into this conversation it's not an easy conversation uh, it's not easy being oh, on the spot. So there's you, some people thanking me here. Great, so. um, Eric, go ahead, unless we lost you. You're up, buddy. I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, well, that that's exactly what I don't want to do here in this hour, because now we're going to start, uh, you know, we're, we're on doctrine, and whether or not men can become gods, the complaint that Scott originally made was that I had misportrayed Mormonism. Apparently, there's an admission that that people can become gods in the next life. And I guess I would ask Scott the question, do you believe Lorenzo no couplet that Sean and I talked about in uh, the last show? As man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. It sounds like you do then. Yeah, and so uh, you you it happened while you were gone, but uh, Sean and I were just discussing that. And so the first question... In there is can we become like our heavenly father and the second question would be uh was our heavenly father once like us on another world and then rose to the station of god right and that's a radically different view than most christians have and i guess uh i can keep this brief but it goes back to what our view of god is right in john 17 christ prays that his followers will become one with him in the same way that he is one with the father and so when we say that we're going to become gods, we become part of that oneness. And that's, you know, it's not that we become one giant uh, entity called God. We retain our individual natures, but we become one with him and that we become united in purpose with him. And we become uh, united with him in the role that he plays in bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Um, and... You know, I, I get that's radically different, and that's fine. Um, but I guess my biggest point in saying that was that aspect of it, I think there's a lot of support scripturally that can be made, and I understand that we're going to read those scriptures differently and that we take them to mean different things, and that's fine. But we take that view from the scriptures. It's not just something that was invented out of whole cloth. Now, the second part of that uh, was God wants a man like, like us here on the earth. And I think it would be more accurate to say that as Latter-day Saints, we believe that uh, Christ was more like Christ once on the earth, right? And this is what we were reading earlier. Um, 
John 5.19. This is an inference Joseph Smith makes from reading John 5.19, and he says, which says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Joseph Smith's inference was, what is, what is Jesus going to do? He's going to come down to the earth. He's going to take upon him the sins of mankind, be resurrected. And he can't do those things unless he saw the Father do them first. And I get it. We don't read that the same way. But it's a view that comes from the scriptures for us. Erica, I know you've got a bunch of questions, but can I just totally for clarification so I understand, Scott, um, is the idea that in in the future if you follow certain of the specific Latter-day Saint teachings, that you will become God of a realm. I know there's debate about exactly worlds, planets, but you will become God and have followers that worship you as we worship God the Father right now. Is that accurate in terms of your yeah, understanding? I think that's, I think that's uh, going a little further than what our doctrine supports. In that, I don't picture myself someday as having my own planet full of spirit children that I alone created, and, you know, I'm just exactly like my Heavenly Father acting in the same role. I think that's overstating what our doctrine says. I don't think we know enough to say that that's the case. I think it's a lot safer, doctrinally speaking, to say we believe that we can become one with God, united in Him in purpose, and perpetuating this uh, act of immortality and eternal life. Beyond that, it's, we can speculate. It's, it's kind of fun, and people have taken that to the extreme of, you know, like the, the South Park rendition of, of that. Um, but I don't think that accurately uh, expresses our doctrinal stance on it. Okay, Eric, go ahead. Jump in if you want clarification. Well, again, I, I think Scott is making the point that what we talked about, because we did talk about the Lorenzo Snow couplet on our previous show, and the whole point of doing this show was to say that we were not accurate in the way that we portrayed the Latter day Saint religion. And from using those verses that Scott's using, it seemed to say very clearly that we were accurate in saying that as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. But that is actually LDS doctrine, and it, that is even taught in current manuals. 2012 and 2013, there were two different manuals, Teachings of Presence of the Church, and that citation was in there, and pretty much what Scott has explained as Mormonism being. And so I want to make sure the whole point of doing this was saying that, yes, this is what Mormonism teaches. This is why we disagree. As far as becoming gods of your own realm, whether or not it, you're, you're in your um, own realm or, or whether it, one in purpose with the Father, however you want to explain it, the idea that people can become gods is not a Christian teaching. That is, uh, that is anything but. I know a lot of Latter-day Saints like to look at Eastern Orthodox teaching and say, uh, well, look, it's called uh, theosis. Uh, and, and I think in Christianity, we do believe in the glorification of the body. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we do believe that there's glorification that follows justification by faith alone and sanctification, the good works that we do, and then there's a future tense of being able to be uh, glorified, but not in a sense that we're gonna be with our, our, heaven, or our earthly families in a heavenly realm. That has never been taught, families being together forever. Well, we do believe in families being together forever, the family of God, because believers are gonna be together, but not a nuclear family in the hopes that father, son, and uh, children, grandchildren are all gonna be together. As far as becoming gods of your own realms, that's been taught over and over again. And I encourage people to go to uh, the website I mentioned earlier, mrm.org slash Scott. And on topic two, can people become gods? I have at least a dozen quotes that show that. Let me just give you one real quick. This is from a, a leader. This is from um, uh, 12th President Spencer W. Campbell. President is the highest uh, office in, in uh, Mormonism. He told the General Conference audience this. Brethren, 225,000 of you are here tonight. I suppose 225,000 of you may become gods. There seems to be plenty of space out there in the universe, and the Lord has proved that he knows how to do it. I think it could make, or probably have us make, worlds for all of us, 
for every one of us 225,000 uh, people. And that's in the uh, Inside Magazine, the official church magazine, a conference edition from November 1975, page 80. So, so I think uh, okay, on, okay. as far as this point, Hold on, uh, just becoming second, gods, I think before you move on, the point has been made. Eric? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just real quick, what does he say there? He says, I, I suppose, meaning he's doing what? He's wondering on the subject. Well, right? I mean, well, I mean, I, there's other quotes that I could give you that it's not just suppose. I mean, uh, another quote, the next one in that list comes from uh, Presidents of the Church Student Manual of Religion 345. They shall organize worlds and rule over them. So I, I know a lot of Latter-day Saints don't like the right, term but worlds that or mean planets, that, whatever you want to call it. But does that mean that each individual is going to organize their own world? That's what I'm saying. I don't know well, if that's, that's what it says. We can state that. Well, it says that we'll all participate uh, in the organization of worlds, but does that mean we do it as a as a group? And I don't have an answer for that, and I know that there are plenty of members who believe that it does mean that we'll have our own world. I don't want to misrepresent that. Um, I guess my biggest gripe with what you guys said before was just the fact that you omitted the fact that we look to the scriptures for our inspiration for that. And yes, we read them differently, but it comes from scripture that we get that idea. That, that is a whole nother debate that obviously we don't have time to enter sure. into um, right now. But I think that's where we, we would differ pretty firmly that just using the scripture and pointing to a passage doesn't mean something necessarily comes from scripture. I think I would not deny that, that Mormon leaders point towards scriptural passages in support of doctrines they have. But I would firmly deny that you find the idea of godhood taught within Scripture itself for human beings. So I'd be happy to concede. Um, yeah, we're going to disagree there. That's fine. You can disagree. Okay, so just uh, so I understand, when you when that Lorenzo uh, Snow couplet to you means minimally that we partner with God in the afterlife making worlds and it's that nebulous it goes no further than that tell me exactly how you understand that couplet and LDS teaching to be in terms of this topic yeah I understand that to mean that we become one with God in the same way that he is one with his heavenly father right Christ is God um, when Christ is one with his Father, we say that that means he shares in all that the Father has, in all of his glory, power, abilities. And in making us one in that same way, Christ elevates us to that same station. And that's it. No further than that. You think we can, after that, it's speculation, you would say? I think so. I mean, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But that's okay. What I believe. Okay, that's fair. Uh, anything on this before we keep going, Eric? Well, I, I mean, let me just quote Joseph Smith in the King Follett Discourse, very famous uh, sermon that Joseph Smith gave a few months before he actually ended up dying uh, at a, in the Carthage Jail in Illinois in 1844. He said this, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. Now, that's completely contrary to what historic Christianity teaches. That is the great secret, he said. If the veil was rent today, and the great God who holds this world in his orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like, like yourselves, in image and very form as a man. Here then, he goes on to say, is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God. And you have got to learn to be capital G gods, yourselves and to be kings and priests to God the same as all gods have done before you namely by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a great one from grace to grace from exaltation to exaltation until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings and to sit in glory as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power it goes back to the first half of the lorenzo snow couplet sean the, the uh, idea that as man is god once was now latter-day saint teachers have shied away from that and say they don't very well understand that. But the idea that somehow God was a human being 
on a previous world and today has a body of flesh and bones as doctrine and covenant section 130 verse 22 says uh, that God uh, apparently in fact a lot of Latter-day Saints will even say that God may have been a sinner that how did he ever die we, we can't die unless we have sinned and so the, the idea that God could have possibly sinned is anathema to the to the evangelical Christian and to think that then that God our God the Father for him in this infinite regress of the gods is it's unfathomable as far as the Christian is concerned that anybody could even think such a thing because it certainly contradicts the Bible I mean it contradicts Psalm 90 verse 2 from everlasting to everlasting thou art God Malachi 3 6 God does not change but it even contradicts the Book of Mormon, which is supposed to be the most correct book of any on earth, Joseph Smith said. And a man could get near to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. I mean, I, I encourage the Latter-day Saint to go read the, uh, the book of, uh, of Moroni, the last chapter, chapter 10. And it very clearly says that, uh, that God is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I would agree with the Book of Mormon on that, but not what Mormonism has decided to teach because you're not going to find this concept in either the bible or the book of mormon scott your thoughts on the king follett uh sermon by joseph smith was god once a man is that a point that you would you would concede mormonism teaches yeah well the point i brought out earlier about john 5 is that's where that comes from is the king follett discourse where joseph smith says it's, he says a few things, but he says, you know, we are really created in the image and likeness of God. He did this before we did. And he specifies looking to Christ as the example, right? That Christ does what he saw his father do. And, you know, if, if you feel like I misrepresented that, I apologize. But, yeah, we do believe that we are going to become gods. What I was saying before is I don't know everything that means. Okay. But we'd love and embrace the doctrine that eternal life means becoming like our heavenly father do you just and, 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 uh, let me just say, let me just say one thing i, I miss i miss her uh, uh it's not moroni tennis moroni 818 and okay so just to, to be clear that god is from everlasting everlasting and i encourage uh, the listeners they want to read that verse along with others that in fact mormonism does not teach that god was ever man and it doesn't teach to multiple gods it does also teach in the idea that there's only one god just one more abutment to, uh, to if you want to read in the Book of Mormon, read Helam in chapter, excuse me, Alma chapter 13 will help to shed some light on what that means. Scott, just so, uh, so I understand, would you I embrace the idea if it sounds like you said God was once a man. So when God was a man, there was a God he was worshiping. Was that God once a man? Would you accept the infinite regress that it's often called of God's? Would you reject it? Would you say it's mystery? What would your position on that be? I would say we don't have any revelation on if, when, or how that began, what that looks like before. We have very little on the idea that our Heavenly Father lived on an earth before we did. And much more than that is speculation. And it's fun to speculate, and plenty of people have. Um, but I don't know. I just don't think there's a lot that we can say authoritatively on it. Okay. But I guess the qu the question is, though, Sean, uh, well, I'm, this would be the qu question I asked Scott, is is do you believe it, whether or not it's speculation? Let me ask you, do you believe in Heavenly Mother? I do. Well, why do you, how do you believe that without any scriptural support? Because it's not found in the standard works. Well, uh, we're created in the image of God, male and female, created he them, right? Um, male and female is the pattern, and we're created in God's image. His image is a, is a male and female. A heavenly Father and a Heavenly so, Mother. I, I, I think so it's you, fair to say you, that yeah. that doctrine specifically is not spelled out very clearly in the scriptures that that is something that comes to us more through revelation than probably a lot of our others. But I will say that there's a strong theme of that that can be found in ancient Judaism. And you can look at the work of Dr. Margaret Barker to see that. I know that her work is heavily disputed because it doesn't conform to what the traditional view on Christianity is, but it's there. And 
for people that want to look at it, I, I think they should. Okay, so you're saying the idea of an infinite number of gods or that man can become God is common within Judaism. I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. No, it's no, one... the, idea, the idea of a female deity, excuse me. Oh, okay, I, miss, I misheard. That was what it's called. Uh, sorry. The idea of a heavenly mother. I've done a lot of work on the idea of a heavenly mother and how that was viewed in ancient Judeo, in Judaism. And there's a big I, dispute there when yeah. Josiah came through and performed his reforms and all the scriptures. Did he do that in accordance with God's will or in opposition to God's will? And I think that she makes a strong case that the, the prophets at the time were stating that that was in, in opposition to God's will. But, you know, that's a whole different topic that we probably don't have time to get into tonight. Okay. Sean, I would say... Let me let me just say, as far as this infinite regress, uh, um, that uh, Scott seems to say, well, I'm not sure it's involving speculation, but he's willing to accept Heavenly Mother, which I think is also speculation. But I, you look at the um, if you look at the logical possibility of an infinite regress, it makes no sense because if you have, there's no such thing as an infinite regress. Uh, William Lane Craig, using the Kalam argument, writes in the Knowledge, a book I highly recommend if anybody would like to read scholarly. Uh, uh, explanations of against Mormon doctrine, and, and he does an excellent job of using the Kalam cosmological argument. You can't have an infinite regress of time and have today happen at the same time. And, and so, while this is a mystery, and I, I, I'm willing to say that certainly would have to be a mystery in the Mormon way of thinking, of course. Uh, just like the Trinity is a mystery to Christianity, and yet at the same time, just because it's a mystery and can't be understood, doesn't mean that we can not at least put down the doctrine of infinite regress that God must have had a God and so on and so forth as taught by LDS leaders. And I would agree it's not Bible nor the Book of Mormon. I certainly agree with that. But you certainly have other things that talk about multiple gods in the other LDS scriptures because there are four of them. You go to the book of Abraham, go to the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price. Very clearly, there are uh, multiple gods. Uh, there's not monotheism in Christianity. And it all goes back to the first question we dealt with, are Mormons Christian? If Mormonism denies or distorts every fundamental teaching of the historic Christian church, I think it's a misnomer to try to pretend that Mormons are just like we are. For the Christian to say, well, we accept you as a fellow Christian. And that's not, I don't think that should happen in life because I'm going to, I'm going to say that if Mormonism is true, then evangelical Christianity is completely wrong, wrong, and wrong because that's what uh, Joseph Smith was told by God supposedly at the first vision. So th this is an important issue. We want to get along, we want to be friendly in our discussion, but at the same time, this is life and death. This is, this is so very important that to just kind of assume that somebody's a Christian and not deal with that. Uh, your friend Eric, I know, has been talking to you about these things, and, and I appreciate the relationship that Eric has with you, Scott. And uh, it's a great relationship to go back and forth and be able to defend your position. But uh, you cannot say that the two are the same. We both could be wrong, uh, but we both can't be right because the law of non-contradiction says that something cannot be A and non-A at the same time. So one of us, if we, I think I'm right, you think you're right, well, then we need to explain why we think that and come up with the reasons. And that's that's a whole different dialogue discussion. And, sure. and I'd be happy to do that down the road with these issues we're talking about. But I'm more interested in, in, in determining, do I understand LDS teaching? And when it comes to God and the multiple, multiple gods that are in existence according to Mormonism, I think I'm perfectly within my right to say Mormonism is not monotheistic, and I'm not sure where I got that wrong or where Sean got that wrong in our December 13th discussion. That was a lot, but Scott, go ahead and <laughs> choose what you want to respond to and weigh in. Sure. Um, well, you say that one of us has to be right and one of us has to be wrong, and I kind of think of it differently. I think that we have to look at, can we each be right to a degree? And to what degree do we each have an amount of truth? And to the degree that we each look to Christ as our Savior, I think that's the common amount of truth that we share. And the things that we've talked about tonight, are those are differences where we look and, and say, you know, yeah, one of us one of us 
probably has a right view or a wrong view, or maybe we're both wrong. Who knows? But in the areas where we do find commonality, I think those are the areas that define what it means to be Christian. Scott, let me let me ask you a question for clarification, then we'll move on a little bit. We're running out of time. I as as an evangelical, I would personally I would say looking at scripture, the idea of an infinite regress of gods is out of bounds theologically speaking. Whether it's Isaiah 44, 46, there is one God from beginning to end. I would rule that out. And even the idea of speculation to me would be speculating on something that violates what scripture teaches. Is that a difference you and I have where you would say, I'm not willing to rule that out. That's at least a possibility. Um, how do you respond to what, what are your thoughts on that point? A difference. I think, I think, uh, so as I was talking before at Alma 13, this probably helps define a little better what we mean. So in, uh, I believe it's in Hebrews, Paul talks about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a great high priest without beginning of days or end of years. And as uh, Eric's pointed out, we believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly. One of the things that Alma 13 sheds light on is what that means a little differently. That uh, Alma 13 talks about Melchizedek priest after the order of Melchizedek or after the order of the Son of God. And I'll quote, this high priesthood being after the order of his son, which order was from the foundation of the world, or in other words, without beginning of days or end of years, being prepared from eternity to all eternity, according to his foreknowledge of all things. Um, and so as you enter into that order, you become like God. You, you become part of that eternal uh, organization or brotherhood of gods, maybe the wrong term, but... Uh, you become one with, with that, uh, with that group, right? Um, I kind of forgot where I was going with that, but yeah, we look at that differently, absolutely. So, ha just again for clarification, the term Christian, historic Christians, evangelicals would firmly reject any definition of yep. polytheism. Yep. And especially the Trinity would be one God in being, three distinct persons who share that divine essence. Um, so one God. Really, after the Council of Nicaea. Um, well, that's a historical debate. I actually think it goes much earlier when you even get to Tertullian at the end of the second century. You see this doctrine being codified because of challenges. But the the point being, um, we'll even go back. Further than that, to our early Judaism, they have what's known as the Divine Council, and they view that differently than we do. But there was an acknowledgement that there were multiple divine beings that met before the world was formed and made decisions and, you know, about what was coming. Uh, the idea that there was only one being, or the Father and the Son even, before the world was created, we know there was at least, at least two. What's the first uh, chapter in the Bible? let us make man in our own image right it's not it's not a singular being there well there is, there's a whole lot of debate even within judaism yes, about no, how many no, beings no. i don't know any jews at all who would say there's multiple gods in the sense of capital g self-existent eternal beings versus making angels or other beings secondary to that in one god view. So that would be. Judaism, I think you're probably 100 right. So, uh, back. So back to my my point is, I would distinctly say, if we mean by polytheism not gods in the lowercase sense of authorities or people that make decisions, even in Psalm 82, which you cited, I think was from John 10, when it says, "You are gods," it also says they will die. So clearly, they're not the kind of self-existent, eternal. God that Eric and I would believe in. In terms of that being, I would distinctly say rule out polytheism because of commitment to one being. Would you reject that right. title? I'm not Is sure that we're still on this because we have agreed that we don't? Uh, I guess the core is: does that exclude us as Christians? And that's some that's a that's a debate that we're not going to solve here tonight, and that every Christian is going to have to decide on their own. 
No, I, I agree. I guess it would help me to say, is it disparaging or misrepresenting to you if I say Mormonism is polytheistic because they believe in distinct individual gods? Is that a misrepresentation of what you believe? Well, I think it is in a way because, as we said, we believe that they're one God, not one being, but one, you know, in the... I was reading First John earlier. It talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are one God. We believe that. We believe that they are one. We believe what being one means is different. But we do believe that they are one God. And, you know, I think even as Latter-day Saints, sometimes in our zeal to talk about the first vision and how Joseph Smith realized that these are two separate and distinct beings that have bodies, you know, we overplay that to the extent that we exclude the re the uh, reality that they are one and for me i know that was really hard growing up to understand well what, what does that mean what do, what do we mean they say they're one and that's a question that's like you say it's uh, been a big question in christianity historically and our answer is a lot different but it still comes down to the fact that we believe they're one god and, and, and here's where i come back in again and ask one god and what one God in purpose, God in essence. And it sounds like, from what you've said previously, you, you believe in one God in purpose, but you could not say that God is one in essence, or you would be a believer in the Trinity that Sean and I hold to. Well, I, so what do you mean by the word essence? I mean, I agree that, that we, we they are in very nature God and... and uh, well, I mean, that they are very nature God. I mean, Jesus in the Council of Nicaea, this purpose was not to deal with the Trinity. And the Trinity was not dealt with later until the Council of Constantinople in 381. Its only purpose was to identify who Jesus was. Well, they identified him as, as God, and, and then they just have in the Nicene Creed, it just says, and the Holy Ghost that they believe in. They have, went through a whole paragraph describing the Son. It's not until 60 years later that that gets uh, more formalized because Christians were working it out due to heresy of Arianism. They were trying to figure out what they believed. So, so uh, what they came up with in the creeds, the uh, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, is very. They were very clear about saying that they are not each other. They're they're not. Uh, a, a glom of a god but rather they're each a god the father son and holy spirit and yet of the same essence they all are fully god not lesser than the other even though jesus did humble himself to become this philippians 2 says it says he, he was in very nature god did not consider equality with god something to be grasped but he humbled himself to become a man to die on the cross and then Verse 9 says that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, which is a quote from Isaiah 45, 24 that was talking about God the Father. It was talking about God the Father would have every knee bow, and here it's Jesus. So Christians had to come to a resolution. What do we believe about Jesus, and then what do we do with the Holy Spirit? And that's how uh, the Trinity, even though it's not a term, the concept is certainly taught that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And just because one uh, Jesus uh, uh, humbled himself does, and, and, be, and was lesser in the, in the sense of authority, he allowed the Father to have authority, didn't mean that he was any lesser of God. And he was 100% God all the way through the incarnation until even after he died. It, it, I'm still not clear on what you mean by essence, but let me ask you this: Do you, either of you two have kids? We we both do. Yep, yeah, we do. Both yep. do. Okay. So as you have kids, and there maybe you even have grandkids. I don't want to assume. You don't <laughs> not yet. You assume. <laughs> not yet. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> but as you have kids, does your having children lessen or elevate you? in life, right? They add to your greatness. Um, and as they grow up and they have kids, that doesn't diminish you that element, right? Now you have children, they have children. Abraham was told this, right? You will have posterity as numerous as the stars. And that wasn't a curse. That was 
that was a great blessing to him. And I think it's the same with our Heavenly Father. He doesn't look at us becoming like him as a station reduction and and uh, that that somehow takes away from him. And in the same way, you know, Christ uh, taking upon us the sins of the world, dying for our sins, raising from the dead, that doesn't, I don't see how that could make a, him any less God than our Heavenly Father, right? He's not a second hand, he's not a, he's not a diminished God in any sense, right? He is our Lord and Savior. He is God. He is one with the Father. That means he's equal with the Father in his station. Um, so, it comes back to, I, I as a Latter-day Saint, really don't completely understand what you mean when you say they're of the same essence. And it's very likely we mean different things. I can only state what I know and I believe, and I believe Christ is our Lord and Savior. Uh, see, see, I believe that God, that Jesus has always been. He's always been God. He's very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father is what the creed says. See, it's, it's not a contradiction. contradiction would say that there is one God and there is not one God. Or God is three persons and God is not three persons. Or even God is three persons and God is one person. Those are all contradictions. But to say that God is three persons and God, that's not a contradiction. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all fully God on their own without any add-in from the others. And yet they are not each other. They are all fully God. And that's what I mean by the essence. And, and what, what I understand Mormonism to teach is that God is one in purpose and not in name. A Latter-day Saint is not able to pray to Jesus because to pray to Jesus is not praying to Heavenly Father who is the only God with whom they have to do. And so in a Latter-day Saint's mind, uh, the Father is the one God, but they don't treat, in, in reality, they don't treat Jesus the same. I mean, just the idea that Jesus wasn't on another world who had to, uh, to, to come to this world, it was had to, as man is, God once was, referring to the Heavenly Father, who then came into this realm to be able to create. And Jesus was created just as all of us are. In fact, he's called um, uh, the son, uh, he, he's a son of the Heavenly Father as much as we are, and the brother of Lucifer. Lucifer's our brother as well. So, uh, and I know Latter-day Saints don't like that, but that is part of LDS teaching from the, from the prophets and lots of citations I can give to support that. Well, that's not the God that I worship. I don't, I, I worship Jesus, I worship the Holy Spirit, I worship the Father, the three who are in one essence, who is God. And I, you know, the Trinity is a mystery. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying I'm gonna be able to give you a full, wrap this around our minds, but just as much of a mystery as an infinite regress of gods that Mormonism has. Uh, eternity is, is an, a mystery as well. We don't understand it, but as Christians believe in it, well, we are certainly not going to solve. Well, we certainly agree there's some mystery there. <laughs> yeah. We, we definitely do. We're certainly not going to solve Trinitarian uh, debates <laughs> right now. Part of this was to talk about uh, really some of the differences where we lie, uh, see what common ground, see what areas we differ on. I, I'm interested in your analogy, uh, Scott, that you used about a parent with kids and grandkids because that kind of seems to fit this idea of an ongoing um, infinite regress, as we discussed before. And as I look at my kids, I want my kids to surpass me. But of course, when they're younger, they're imperfect and they're growing and they have to learn and mature over time. So that's one difference I might bring in that, that we would see things. Jesus didn't grow, didn't learn and mature, except in his human state, but certainly not morally speaking. Um, I know our kids do. Um, your thoughts on that very quickly, and then we'll give each person kind of just a final thought to wrap up because uh, we've been going for some time. We're not going to get to some of the other topics we, we thought we might get to. Sure. Um, oh, my brain just shut down. Ask that uh, one more time. You know what? That's okay. I was I was referencing back to the grandparent analogy oh, of where there's an uh, infinite I, I regress and development. Yeah, so I, I guess uh, this doesn't quite answer what you're asking, but it's something I wanted to touch on that Eric said, that we don't believe that Jesus is eternal. Uh, and I guess we do, but we do in a different sense. Uh, we believe that 
each of us is eternal, that our, that our intelligence has always existed and will always always exist, and that our Heavenly Father organized it into a spirit, and then we come down to earth and get a mortal body. Um, so I just want to push back on that idea that we don't believe that Christ is eternal. We do. We believe that differently, but you know, we believe he was with the Father from the beginning as a spirit, or the beginning even, you know, if, if there was such a point, uh, that he still existed eternally as an intelligence, just as we all do. Scott, if I can ask just for clarification, I think if if I understand correctly, then Jesus, that would be true for him, and it'd be true for all of us, that we're all eternal in the same sense, whereas Eric and I would say, we are created beings. Jesus is uniquely an eternal being. Colossians 1.15, he's the firstborn, meaning preeminent over all of creation. So is Jesus distinct Correct. from but others? We would, we would take that, we would understand the scripture differently. We believe that he is the firstborn and the only begotten in the flesh of the Father. But we, we are eternal. But we are eternal in the same way that Jesus is eternal. That's right. Okay. All right. Hey, this, is, this has been so fascinating. Sorry to those of can you I with say the one last thing on that, Ron. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can I say one? Just, just, sure. just real quick. It won't be long. All right. I mean, Mormonism does teach an eternal intelligence. If I said, if I mistakenly said that Jesus is not eternal in Mormonism, I didn't mean that. What I would have meant if I, if I said that, what I really meant was Jesus is not eternally God. And so in Christianity, we believe that Jesus has always been God in all eternity. In the beginning, uh, as John 1 says, uh, uh, the Word was with God. The Word was God. He has always been God. And Mormonism teaches that, no, he was a created being who became a God, not always has been God. Anyway, that's. I just wanted to make sure that so, was understood. Go ahead, Scott. You know, scripturally, we would, we would point to scriptures that say he was ordained to be the savior before the foundation of the world. I don't know that there's a starting point for that statement, that even as an intelligence, he was always destined to be our Lord and savior and always God. Um, so I don't know that you can really say that we believe there was a point he wasn't God. Uh, if I'm wrong, then... Well, I mean, ontologically, really quick, was he always a God? I mean, yeah. I think, I think there's support for that idea, yeah. Even in LDS teaching. Um, really quick though, uh, I feel like we've spent a lot of time on these other other subjects, and that's great. You know, we've had some great dialogue, and I want to thank you both. You've been very gracious, and I really appreciate that. Um, and you know, like we we when we started out the last time, I said this, but then our feed didn't carry through. I'm a nobody member of the church who you guys were both gracious enough to just agree to do this with some random stranger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I want to talk really quickly and I'll make this short because I know we're about out of time when we look at the Bible and how we view the Bible as we grow up there's kind of three levels that we can look at it at and when we're young kids we learn about Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Noah's Ark and all the animals on the ark right a very simplistic level and there's a second level that a lot of people like to attack the Bible on and say, well, the Bible teaches that the earth was created in six days. That has to be taken literally. And if, if it was. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we literally lost both of them on his closing speech. Scott's coming back. I don't know what is going on. Let me assign you to the right. Uh, S Scott, we lost you, man. I'm sorry. You're back. You were just... Yeah, you're good. Keep going. Okay. So, as we were saying, you know, there's that second level that, you know, a lot of the new atheism has attacked us on. Well, the Bible teaches slavery, uh, six-day creation, and uh, on and on, all these other issues that come up as we study the Bible, and they say, look at how this is morally reprehensible, and this is not a guide that we look at. And I think there's a third level that us as Christians have to rise to, where we can look at the Bible and and understand that there's a lot of deeper meaning here and a lot of deeper context and that those those second level attacks are a little superficial and don't really represent what we as christians believe right okay and not i hope you don't take this the wrong way but i feel like in a lot of ways that was kind of what your discussion was last time about our faith it was all 
attack, attack, attack. Never show the full picture of what we believe. And um, never really rise to that third level of examination of how is it that the Latter-day Saints can believe all these things when all of these other objections exist? And since we don't have time for everything that we had wanted to discuss before, I'll just really quickly touch on, uh, let's say, the gold plates, right? And so in the last discussion, the two of you were talking about uh, golden plates and how that totally doesn't fit with reality because they would have been too heavy uh, and on and on, right? And as an example of why we find that credible, there's a material that the plates could have been made out of that was found in ancient America that fits the size and weight description and that perfectly matches everything that we would expect to find if these plates were made of this material. It's Tumago, right? Tumago. And so on an issue like that, oh, go ahead. I would say if you're unaware of that, that would answer why it is that we that you think that's such a preposterous idea and if you are aware of it then why don't you bring that up when you're talking about it and that's a whole different i mean we did talk about that and the way it relates that uh was very accurate as far as the weight of gold and everything else and we may disagree as i think we disagree in a lot of things i think that's been shown tonight i, I don't think that i'm misstating mormonism by by saying that, that uh, well, because of the weight of the place, I think that's a mark against the gold place, one of many different marks. And if you're going to use Tumbaga, well, that's a uh, Central America theory. But most uh, Mormons that I talk to, including Rodney Meldrum, uh, Glenn Beck, and others, they believe in the Heartland model. They believe that it actually took here. There is no such thing as Tumbaga. But it's interesting how uh, many Latter day Saints well, will use Tumbaga to try to lighten the such- place. I don't think anybody would disagree that Tobaga exists. We find it, you know, it, it's a real in material that was used by ancient Americans. Right. And if you make plates out of it, it comes out to be about the right size and shape. It looks like gold. Uh, Josiah Stoll reports seeing that he saw a corner of the plates as Joseph was handing them to him through a window and that they had a greenish tint, which supports the idea that there was copper in them. Uh, I guess... That's an example of a deeper level conversation that's being had within the church, but it was completely glossed over as in Mormons believe the plates were made of gold. They have no good answer for this. And so therefore there's no good reason to believe it. Well, that's what the angel said in history of the uh, Joseph Smith history, chapter one, I think it's verse 34. And it says that uh, the angel said they were made of gold. They're not gold in. And I mean, it's a side issue. There's a lot of things that we, I think I can point to to say, I really doubt just the fact that Joseph Smith had to use a seer stone and a hat to translate it. Why did he even need those plates in the first place? Uh, we, we see that Joseph well, Smith that did not have the ability the, to translate deeper... accurately with the book of Abraham. Go ahead. I think that goes back to the deeper question, though, of we look at this as this is a miracle. And rather than looking at the product of the miracle, we want to debate about the mechanics of a miracle. Um, the mechanics of a miracle are always going to be miraculous, right? Rather than talking about, about how did Joseph Smith translate the book of Abraham, for example, you know, we can look at, well, what does the book of Abraham say? And, you know, their fair Mormon has a list of 41 different uh narrative elements that appear in the book of abraham that don't appear in the bible but that do appear in other ancient abraham texts a lot of them were unknown to joseph smith at the time and he just got really lucky and he guessed that those elements would be there that ancient people did believe this about abraham and he put those in his book and lo and behold it turns out that he's vindicated in a lot of that right the 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 entire idea that a book about Abraham would be written in Egyptian was laughed at for a long time as an example of something that proved the book of Abraham wrong. Well, now we have lots of examples of of uh, Abraham showing up in Egyptian writing, and we have a, a book about Abraham. I've, I've got a copy right here on my desk that was written in Coptic, right? It's an Egyptian text. And over time, a lot of these things that are considered anachronisms move from plausible to confirmed. Not all of them. But I think history has been pretty good to Joseph Smith and his predictions. 
I, I want to say, Sean, I appreciate uh, being able to be on here today. Scott, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I guess I would conclude by just saying I, you may not have liked the way that the way that we believe or the way that we've stated things. And it was all meant in respect. You know, we knew Latter-day Saints could be listening. I never want to be disrespectful to you or your beliefs. But I think tonight has shown that there wasn't anything that we said that was really inaccurate as far as what the church teaches, the doctrines that are taught. Yes, we disagree about whether or not uh, Latter-day Saints are Christian. Yes, we disagree about the idea of men becoming gods. And there are other things that are on the agenda that we could certainly go into further, and that could be another discussion. But I, I just, I think it's very, really important to be careful to say that we were not accurate in portraying your religion, your faith, because I think we were, and I haven't seen tonight, besides maybe not liking the way that we talked about the way of the plates, and that's just a personal preference uh, you may not have liked, but uh, I think as far as the accuracy, I don't see anything that we said on December 13th is wrong as far as what your leaders taught or what the standard works teach. And so I, I just want to make that very clear. Uh, you're, you're a great guy, and I appreciate your beliefs. You're free to believe whatever you want to believe. But I just, uh, I feel that I have the ability, having studied Mormonism, as long as I have, having read the standard works multiple times, uh, and, and reading Einstein Magazine every month, reading everything the church produces, I think I have a pretty good grasp on what Mormonism teaches, and that's how, uh, that's what I wanted to show tonight. And I think, I think uh, I was able to do that. Scott, you're raising some and great. I would just say. Let, let me jump in here real oh, fast, yeah, Scott. I would just say. One of the you've raised a couple issues here at the end that I would love to have you back on. We could discuss these: the plates that are golden, uh, the Book of Abraham. We didn't get a chance to get to either of those. Oh, Eric had to go. He had a meeting. He had to had to run too. Um, sure. So we could come back and debate those particular things. I think the goal tonight, which I think was accomplished pretty well, is just to clarify. And we lost him. I did not cut him off, just for the record. We lost him. I don't know why that's happening here. Um, but the goal tonight was to bring some clarification. Hope they're coming back in. Both of them are. Um, you you guys are, are both back in here. I was just uh, just wrapping up with a thought. We're, uh, we're wrapping up tonight. We'll come back and we can have a debate on the Book of Abraham sometime. I think that'd be fascinating. A discussion about the gold plates and uh, some of the questions that you've raised here at the end, Scott, I think are great. I think for now we want to find some clarification. We didn't even get to faith versus works, but men can become gods. The question of Mormons being Christians. I think we at least had a respectful dialogue and uh, tried to clarify some of our differences in understanding. So I really appreciate both of you coming on. There's a lot of comments here. I think there's people from the LDS Church and Evangelicals, but there's a lot of comments uh, thanking you for coming on in particular, Scott, to talk with two uh, Evangelicals and your willingness to to do that. So you guys hang on for just a second. We're going to wrap up here, but uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I thought I had the glitches figured out, but we have Michael Behe, J.P. Moreland. Uh, we have talks on assisted suicide and a whole bunch coming up here uh join us soon uh hit subscribe button and notifications got a lot of shows coming up all right have a wonderful night thanks thanks guys